Well, we're glad to be back with everyone tonight in our continuing study of the book of John. I hope that those who listened to the preceding devotional talk gave good attention to it because that was a, a fine lesson regarding don't be deceived. The devil deceives us by getting us to believe a lie. And there's many ways in which you can do that. James helped us very practical men see how we need to be so very careful and cautious with a lot of things, but as he ended his lesson, especially when it comes to our soul salvation and security. Now, going on into our study of John, remember it's apologetic nature. That is, John is giving evidence that proves that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the only begotten Son of God. He is defending the deity of Jesus Christ. Now, when we come into chapter 4, and again, you need to read that yourself. We need to remember that in the preceding chapters, that he was presenting material that would convince the Jews that Jesus Christ was the Messiah, the Son of God. But when we come to what we have is chapter 4, remembering that men put the chapters and verses in here, they were not in the original, that he now presents himself to the Samaritans. Again, that's in chapter 4 of John. So in effect, he's calling this Samaritan woman to the witness stand, and she's going to give her testimony concerning Jesus Christ. We don't know her name. We know that she is from Samaria. And we learn from the text that the Lord left Judea, which is where Jerusalem is. And he started up again toward Galilee. Now, the Jews routinely did not travel straight north from Jerusalem to Galilee because they didn't go through the land of the Samaritans. They would travel down to Jericho, cross the Jordan River, go up the east side of the Jordan, then cross back over into Galilee because they just wouldn't have a thing in the world to do with Samaritans because they considered them a bunch of mongrel people and they wouldn't have anything to do with it. We could go into more of that, but we won't now. So he leaves, he goes toward Galilee, an interesting point made in John 20. It says that Jesus must needs pass through Samaria. Interesting statement. He must. Well, most all the rest of them in the routine travel didn't consider themselves compelled to go through Samaria. But the scripture says he must needs pass through Samaria. He must. It's In his mind, there was an obligation that he had to fulfill by going through Samaria. Well, in doing so, Jesus came to Jacob's well, and there was a parcel of ground there that Jacob had given to Joseph, actually. And we see him being as human as the next person after traveling away. He's tired. And he rests there while his disciples went into the city to buy food. Well, we see a little bit of the custom of the times. It was the women's job to draw water. Water was never a, something in that area, or even today, that uh, easily found as it is in other parts of the world. So here's a well. Whose well is it? It's, well, it's been there a long time. It's Jacob's well. If you go over there today, you can go to where that place is. Now, the Kaiser, back before World War I, started building a church around it, got the walls up, and war started, and that's where it was left, and it was finished. But it's there. It's just a, a big, open face well going very deep. Well, the Lord began to talk with this woman. And he began the conversation talking about physical water. 
and as it was the way with the Lord and as the master teacher example for you and me and how to study with people and to get their attention. He very skillf skillfully turned the conversation to spiritual water. Now let me pause here and emphasize what I did, I think even last week or at least sometime before, that we should, as members of the church, God's children, since the Lord's charged the church with teaching the lost the gospel, there should always be upon our mind in visiting with people to find out their spiritual status. What is the situation? Whatever we're talking about, we can learn from the Lord to skillfully, deftly turn the conversation to something spiritual. You know, people have no problem talking about the Astros or some other ball team of some kind, or what's going on somewhere. And they may be strangers to one another, but they try to use some sort of common ground. It's usually sports or something like that. Well, you could do the same thing in trying to turn it to spiritual matters. I don't know that we're oriented that way like we ought to be as faithful children of God. Nevertheless, that's what he did. And the Lord claimed that he was in possession of spiritual water. And he said, if you drink of what I have to offer, you'll never be thirsty again. Now, the Lord got the woman's attention, to say the least. I think if uh, any of us lived in that part of the world, water was as scarce as it can be in a very arid, dry climate, that would get our attention. He made reference to personal problems she had. And he answered some of her religious questions. And he taught her a great lesson on true worship. Now, it's interesting that he talks about true worship. Well, to hear some people speak of worship, if they even know the meaning of worship, you would think anything you did or thought concerning God, if they're good thoughts, would be acceptable to God as worship. I hear people all the time talk about, well, I have been blessed to be a good piano player and I play my piano for the Lord. And you remember there's a song that shows up around Christmas every year since the religious world looks at that as Christ's birthday. The little drummer boy, I played my drum for him. Beautiful little song. Has nothing to do with the scriptures, but where does that ever stop anybody from thinking God's going to accept what they offer? The true worships are acts of obeisance paid. The word most used for worship is proskuneo. And it carries with it the idea of actually prostrating oneself before another to do obeisance and to show homage. Well, the Lord knows exactly how he wants to be worshipped. The woman made a statement and said, I, I know that when Messiah comes, that he's going to tell us all things. And Jesus very boldly said, I that speak unto thee am he. This is all after he's taught about worship. Now they're under the law of Moses. Thus he says, salvations of the Jews because she wondered why uh, their worship wasn't acceptable there in the mount. Well, keep in mind, Jesus was a Jew after the flesh, and he lived and died under the authority of the law of Moses. And he makes it very clear that under the law of Moses, salvation is of the Jews. He did not hesitate to say what was right. Some people would have got her attention like he did, but they would have been afraid they would run her off if they'd said something like that. Maybe she would run him off. He's in her country. There was no, there was no love lost between Jews and Samaritans. 
but they all recognized that there was a Messiah to come. And he plainly says, I that speak unto thee am he. We should understand how we should use great plainness of speech. Paul said he did that, that he used great plainness of speech. Now, there's a reason for that. We want to be understood. People must understand the gospel. They must understand the application of it to their own lives. We who know it, we who have obeyed it, we who live according to it in the family of God, the church, we must want to tell others about it. And notice here, the Lord, you, you, you couldn't be any more humble than the Lord. You couldn't be any more loving than the Lord. Certainly, he loved that woman's soul. And that did not forbid him or hinder him from speaking very plainly. I that speak unto thee am he. And as he spoke of worship and true worship, worshiping God in spirit and in truth under the law of Moses, he made it clear that as Samaritan, you don't know what you're worshiping. But the Jews do, for salvation is of the Jews. It is a sad day indeed that covers much of this world's religious views. It says you can't make a plain statement like that. Do you think I'm lost? A man says who has never obeyed the gospel. How would you answer that? I not only think that person's lost, I know you're lost. That's the reason I'm talking to you. You're lost in sin. Your sins are keeping you from God. You need to know how to gain forgiveness of sin. I think sometimes we think that people are all ready to just completely reject the truth. We don't understand the power of truth. And truth needs to be stated plainly. Now, some of them would say, well, why do you believe that? Well, then we begin to show them from the word of God why we believe that. Now, notice the impact when he said, I that speak unto thee and he, I am the Messiah. Notice the impact they had on the woman. Well, to say the least, she was very excited. She's so excited, she left her water pot, went away into the city, and she declared to the people, come, See a man who told me all things that ever I did. Can this be the Christ? Well, he hadn't told her all things ever she did. But he said enough about her for her to understand the implication he could have if he had wanted to. Because he had no way of knowing what her situation was. Call your husband. Well, I don't have a husband. Well, you well said, Jesus said, You've had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. That sounds pretty much up to date to me and the kind of people you would talk to around about us as you go out to try to teach the truth to them. You're going to run into people like that. And there's no use beating around the bush about the whole matter. Just speak the truth as Jesus did. Now, John is saying plainly to us, this is how the Lord's conduct and how his message affected this woman of Samaria. People hear so many lies and they approach so many people who are trying to flatter them and get on their good side and say sweet nothings to them. Uh, it surprises them to hear somebody be so bold. And we need to be bold. If anybody in this world needs to be bold, members of the church of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, need to be candid, frank, and bold. That doesn't mean we don't love people and are tenderhearted and kind and cherish them as nursewood or children and so on. Paul said he was that way. But he also asked for prayers that he would speak up and be bold. And that's what we need to be. You may not be able to engage in a long Bible study, but you can state the truth about matters. We also then have the testimony, not only of the woman that started this whole thing, as John recorded it in John 4, but we have the testimony of the Samaritans. Notice that because of the word of the woman, 
there were many who left the city and went out to him. The process of things, um, the Lord is talking to his disciples. And as usual, they're kind of surprised about this whole thing. It would have been interesting. My human curiosity would like to have heard them and seen them when he says, I must need to go through Samaria because they wouldn't have on their own. And now, lo and behold, he comes back and he's been talking to a, a woman of Samaria. We don't realize to this day the status of women in those day and time or in a lot of places in the world today. But then to add to it that he is a Jewish man and she is a Samaritan, and he has asked of her water, that would have almost bowled her over. Then for it to turn out the way that it did when his disciples came, and there he was. Notice that he talks to them about his mission. He says to them, I'm here to do the work of God who sent me. I don't know whether we think about that anywhere or nearly as much as we ought to. I'm here to do the work that the Lord sent me to do. Jesus Christ of Nazareth had his work to do. He's the only begotten son of God. And he was the only one that could do it. He said one time in John 9, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. And there's another must. And it's the works of him that sent me. Well, we only have the time that we have, and we don't know when that's going to end. But once we learn the truth ourselves and obey it, baptize into Christ, we're new creatures in Christ, we're brothers and sisters of the family of God. We have the hope of eternal life. The Great Commission is placed upon the church's shoulders then we should have the idea that I have a work to do. And that means the church, members of the church have a work to do. Nobody else on this earth has to do. I don't know whether they think about it that much, but that's exactly what ought to happen. People aren't turning out by the droves to be gospel preachers. I think I know one reason why. From the heart, they don't feel compelled to do the work of their father and to leave a whole lot of things and to take care of what ought to be first. Now, that doesn't mean the person can't support himself financially to do it, but it means that the word of God ought to be a burning fire and they can't be quiet about it. And they're going to do all they can they for themselves to learn it, to teach it, and to defend it. So he talks with the disciples about the work that God sent him to do. He also talks about some great opportunities that are set before them. Notice how he says, the fields are white under the harvest. They're already under harvest. Well, you look around about you today, and we constantly talk about how bad off the United States is now. Terrible things are getting, and they're going from bad to worse, to much worse, and on and on and on. Uh, that means they need the gospel, and that may mean they're more ready for the gospel than any of us ever thought they would be. It just means we have to be bold, and we have to find ourselves to look for a woman at the well and be able to speak as our Lord spoke. It may be a woman in Walmarts. No telling where it may be. Maybe a man at the hardware store or our next door neighbor. Well, some way we can find out whether there is a desire on their part to know something about spiritual matters. Now, from that city, that's city Sychar, many of the Samaritans believe on the Lord because of what the woman had said, the word of the woman. Then we learn that many Samaritans came to him personally. That is, they, they saw him and they heard him. And the scripture says that many more believed because of the word they heard from Jesus. 
And thus those Samaritans said to the woman, Now we believe, not because of thy speaking, for we have heard for ourselves. And notice what Heights put, and know, okay, you know, to know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. And know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. I don't know whatever else he said to them directly. The Bible doesn't tell us. But I think we can be sure it would be somewhat like he said to the woman because it created faith in them, in him. And I know it takes proper evidence for faith to be formed. I think it's important for us to realize also because of a false view about faith and knowledge that many of us in this class have not all been exposed to in our teaching at the Spring Congregation. That, of course, people say, well, where your knowledge ends, your faith begins. Well, nothing could be more false than that. Notice that these people saw and they heard. And in seeing and hearing, they did not, those things, seeing and hearing, did not preclude believing. That knowing does not preclude believing. And believing does not preclude knowing. So when people jump up and say the only kind of knowledge there is, is empirical knowledge, what you can see through your eyes, and smell through your nose, and taste, and hear, and touch, then you realize that is knowledge. But then there's knowledge that we get through contemplation and logical thinking. And that's how it is when it comes to us preaching the evidences in the gospel that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God. We can say the exact same thing the Samaritan said to the woman. Now we believe. Or like the woman said herself, we believe. But notice they couldn't say that without evidence proving that the one they heard from was God's Son. Thus we're set about to prove the deity of Christ the existence of God, the Father, the inspiration of the scriptures. But to believe that Christ is the Son of God doesn't mean I don't know the facts that prove the matter to be the case. We have another situation we might mention now and then look at it later on, and that is uh, Thomas. I grew up hearing Poor fellow called Doubting Thomas and everybody thinking he wasn't what he ought to be. Well, after the resurrection, Thomas wasn't with the other disciples when the resurrected Christ appeared to him one time. They tried to tell him, but he wouldn't believe. And he said, unless I can put my fingers in nail scars of his hands and feet and put my hand in his side for a spear pierced him, I'm not going to believe. So all of a sudden, the Lord appears later on with the disciples and Thomas is there. And he says, put your fingers in the nail scars, your hand in my side. And be not faithless, but believing. Well, now that was empirical knowledge. He knew that this was the resurrected Christ. But that didn't set apart him from his faith. Faith is enhanced, it's created and enhanced by the facts of the case. What John is saying here is that this is the testimony of the Samaritans. And what is it? This is indeed the Savior of the world. That's what we need to be preaching to people. You look around about you, people don't know. They, they're wishy-washy who is what, who is whatever, and they're tossed to and fro by every opinion and idea that 
flows around. You don't see that in the Bible. And especially here in the case of John the Apostle offering these proofs that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God, and we should be the same way. Remember, we're members of the spiritual body of Christ, the church. Christ is our head. Where he left off, we continue under the commission to preach the gospel to every creature. The gospel being the power of God to save. Romans 1.16. Further, as we go on with this, time allows. We have the testimony of those Galileans. Remember, he started out with Judea. He said, I must need to go through Samaria. Now he goes on through Samaria and comes to Galilee. Now the Galileans had been at the feast of Jerusalem. And they had seen all things that he did in Jerusalem. Well, we don't have all the details and the particular signs that he worked there. They saw all of them. So when he came into Galilee, Scripture says the Galileans received him. Now note this. This is how the Lord's work further south and up there in Jerusalem, had affected these Galileans. All these Jews under the law had gone down to the feast days and seen the works of Jesus in Jerusalem. Now they've gone back home. Jesus comes later. And they remember very well the things that Jesus did in Jerusalem. And on the basis of that, they received him. So then we have the testimony of the second sign as inspiration guided the Apostle John to write it. There was a certain nobleman, an official, whose son was sick in Capernaum. Now, Capernaum is down on the Sea of Galilee, just to the northwest side. We were there, we left on a boat from the southeast side and traveled northwest all the way across the sea and landed at Capernaum. The nobleman came to the Lord, and he's very humble. He pleads with him, saying, Sir, come down and save my child's life. He knew enough about things to know the child's going to die. We'll make the story a little bit shorter. He told him to go his way. His son lives. Now notice this man accepted what the word of the Lord revealed to him. He believed in on the basis of the word that the Lord had given. Now you must understand these Galileans had already received him on the basis of the signs that Jesus worked in Jerusalem. There had to be some reason this man came to Jesus and asked him to come save his child. Well, when he starts home, after the Lord told him that, he meets his servants, and they said, your son's alive. And he asked, what time did he get rid of that fever? That's what he had. And it says he began to amend about the seventh hour. Well, the father knew then that that was the hour in which Jesus had said, thy son liveth. That's an amazing thing. What do we do about these signs? What are they signs of? They're not signs of themselves. They point to something. What did the Galileans think they pointed to? So much so that this man with a son about to die comes to him and asks for help. Obviously, they were convincing them that this was at least a prophet of God. Now, our time is about to play out here, and I don't really want to go into chapter 5 right now. So I think we'll cut it a few minutes short. If you have any questions as I go through these things, jot them down and we can deal with them. But uh, 
we'll call this a halt for tonight. And thank everybody for being here. Hope you all can uh, make it to the lectureship at Fish Hatchery Road on Saturday. Whatever the case, before we go, let's have a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, humbly we approach thee to glorify thy name and the hallowed to thank thee for our time together in the midst of this very busy week to stop and to think and meditate on thy word. May we meditate on it day and night. May we be honest in the reception of it and application of the same to our lives. And may we remove things from our lives and impede us in being what we can be in service to thee. We pray for those traveling that they'll arrive home safely. We pray for the sick and afflicted and orphans that they would be helped according to thy providential care. May our faith be stronger, our love more fervent. Help us that we might care for the lost and love our brethren and help us to so live our lives that someday we can hear fall from the lips of our Savior, well done, our good and faithful servant. Enter ye into the joys of thy Lord. And with these pleasant thoughts in mind, we leave thy throne for the moment. In the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen.